You are listening to Double Page Spread, brought to you by Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab. Try some of their new perfume oils, such as Snow Moon. Snowdrops pushing through a pale white blanket of crystalline musk, pale white frozen apples, white tea leaf, yuzu, and angelica root. So you can check out that and many of their other exotic fragrances over at blackphoenixalchemylab.com. And you can go and order some comics from DCBS, the Discount Comic Book Service, over at dcbservice.com. If you are not fortunate enough to live near a wonderful local comic shop or there's just some stuff you forgot, go on over there and they will give you some ridiculous discounts. And if you want to support us here at Double Page Spread, please feel free to drop a review on iTunes, give us some stars, or better yet, order some merchandise off of our Threadless store. You can get everything from shower curtains to duvet covers to uh, to t-shirts to stickers and notebooks, all with our very cool logos designed by Tom Kelly. So I hope you're having a wonderful day. Welcome back to Double Page Spread, and my name is Wendy Freeman, and I am joined tonight by a very uh, long-standing, prominent inker and writer in the comic community, a wonderful person, Mr. Carl Kiesel. Well, hello, Wendy. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty great. Pretty great. Yourself? I'm doing wonderful. So, yeah, you've been you've been working forever for, like, every, every company, every character, everything imaginable since, uh, what, the mid-80s? Yeah, I, I started full time uh, in '84, just as I turned 25. So that's that's how I marked it. Yeah, that's that's a good marker. So, uh, did you you began as an inker? Had that always been your been your plan? Uh, well, you know, since I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a cartoonist. But as in, to be an inker, no. Um, you know, I, I, the long story short is, you know, uh, maybe you know, I, I actually uh, went to the Joe Kubert School for one year in 1977. That was, uh, at the time, it was a two-year course, and I, quite honestly, when I got there, and I thought, I, you know, I thought it was pretty hot stuff, you know, and I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, and I got into the Cubert School, and you know what? There were really talented people at that school. There, there were people like Steve Bissett and John Tottleman, and, and I, I still, you know, I'm dumbfounded to this day. I remember the first time I met John, he was at his drawing board. He had a piece of paper. He took a pencil. He drew a big S on it that filled most of the paper. Then he put his pencil down, picked up an ink brush, and drew this amazing sea serpent. Amazing. And all he had was basically the spine of the sea serpent on the paper. And quite honestly, my year there... I decided I didn't have what it took to be a cartoonist. And so I, I left the Kubert School after one year, and I went to the Hartford Art School in Hartford, Connecticut. And very quickly I, after that, I said, you know, I really do want to be a cartoonist. And now I knew what I had to strive for, and I worked really hard for it. And, uh, you know, by the time I was 25 in 1984, I was working in the field as an inker. And the reason I got in as an inker was when I had, when I had an opportunity to step back I looked at my strengths and weaknesses, and I said, you know, there's people out there who can draw a lot better than you, who can pencil a lot better than you, but your ink line is pretty nice. I even had friends who told me they really liked my ink line, so I really figured that was my strong suit. That was my strong card, and that was what I used to get my toe in the door. Well, that's awesome. You got to use what you got. You know, I love John Toliban. He is from the same county that I lived in, in Pennsylvania. Wow. Yeah, so he was the first comic artist I ever harassed. <laughs> <laughs> he's a great guy he's a really great guy yeah, he's a very kind very good man i love him uh, one of my favorite things of course that you that you inked over was you you did inks over george perez's uh history of the dc universe yes i did that was uh quite an honor i mean i was i was still very wet behind the ears and uh, for some some reason they decided to give me that job uh, it was a great great honor and a great thrill and uh I, you know i had a lot of fun on that, that project did you have any uh, particular mentors in, in inking when you started? Or, Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I've always loved Joe Sinnott's inking, and, and I am very much a brush man, so I think that has a lot to do, you know, with my affinity towards that look. But, of course, I also love the Kirby uh, Sinnott Fantastic Fours. You know, I mean, that's some of my very favorite comics of all time. So, I mean, one kind of feeds the other in a way. And my other huge mentor character would be Milton Kniff, who, again, is a very much a, an ink 
uh, a brush man. He uses brush for an awful lot of what he does. And uh, the style that he, he drew in with uh, the shadows and the real lush incline, that really spoke to me uh, once I discovered his work. Speaking of Milk Kniff, like, I always find it, I would like to get into more classic sort of strip reading, you know, but I, it's so daunting because so many of those things like Terry and the Pirates and so forth just span so many years. Yeah. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to figure out sort of like where to pick up with that, that type of thing. Oh well, yeah, but you got to understand, uh, theoretically, and Kniff did this really well, theoretically, you can jump in at any point and each daily strip, I mean, unlike a page of comic books, you know, you know, a comic book page is not meant to stand on its own, but a comic strip is meant to stand on its own. And theoretically, you could pick up Carrying the Pirates at any point and start reading. And in a very short time, you know, theoretically in one day, you should at least know the basics of what's going on. And within a few weeks, you should understand the characters and the interactions and stuff like that. I mean, really, really, it's a very bad excuse, Wendy. You really could start reading any, any of this stuff at any point. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> But um I mean I would highly recommend, you know, his his, you know, like starting in nineteen thirty six, you know, when Burma is introduced into the um into the strip. That that's really when it caught fire as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all these have been have been collected so many times and really nice collections. Yeah. Yeah, IDW has a beautiful Terry and the Pirates collection and now of course they're doing the uh, Steve Canyon stuff. And um, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, I'm, you know, I love Kniff's work. Uh, I wish I'd met him. I, I missed him, really, almost by just a few weeks. He was supposed to give a chalk talk at DC Comics in the '80s when I when I lived in New York. I could have gone because I went to chalk talks that uh, that uh, Harvey Kurtzman gave and Will Eisner gave, and DC did this for the freelancers quite often. And um, they scheduled Kniff, and I was like so excited because he was my man. But then he got sick, and within a few weeks after that, he died. So fortunately, I never got to meet him. Um, but uh, he, he and I, uh, especially towards the end of his life, would have differed wildly politically. He became extremely conservative. Um, but uh, but his, his early Terry stuff, when there there isn't a, a big conserv conservative streak, military streak, I should even say, in his in his work, they were great adventure comics. They were just top of the line adventures. Do you feel that like uh, that it's it's hard to separate the art from the artist and things like that? So many so many tremendous uh, people like you know like people could disagree with uh, Ditko's views or, or things like that, but there there's so many people where their art just what they did sort of surpasses. Yeah, I mean you know you you've got to make that decision for yourself. I generally can uh, separate uh, political views from uh, from the art. I mean I. You know, I, I, I've worked with Chuck Dixon. I like Chuck Dixon. I think he's a crazy man when it comes to politics. I mean, literally crazy. But I really think he knows how to mimic comics. It's just political. You know, and we seem to get along well. I mean, he said many times that I was one of the. I don't want to say many times, but he said some at least once, at least once <laughs> that uh, he really enjoyed working with me. So, and I've really enjoyed working with him, and uh, I enjoy his comics. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 you know, like I said, people have to make that their decision on that by themselves. But uh, I, I can separate for the most part. There, there are lines, you know, there are lines that people cross, and then you, you you've got to reevaluate. But, um, but for the most part, I can separate that. Yeah, Ditko and I would have been very different politically too. But I love his work. In fact, I think my own penciling, in many ways, I think owes a lot more to Ditko than to uh, Kirby or Kniff. Partly because I feel my stuff is, is when I draw myself a little mannered and a little stiff, which I think of when I see Ditko's work. Never slowed him down, but slows me down. Speaking of comic strips, you had done the Captain America 1940s style strip. Yeah, yeah. Actually, boy, I'm, I'm amazed you even know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so cool. I think that's super cool. And I, I wanted to ask you about like how you how you captured that flavor, like how you did the sort of pacing for that, how, how different that was. Well, I mean, it wasn't, it was not hard for me because quite honestly, many times in my life, I have wished I was born 50 years earlier so I could do an adventure comic strip. I have a real affinity for whatever reason to that pacing and that approach. And, and I just like that, uh, you know, you've got four panels, you know, in the classic strips, when, when they had space enough to, to uh, do four panels. And that's just enough to get 
you know, a li- some information in there, some cleverness in there, and you end on a little bit of a cliffhanger. And uh, that sort of pacing has a, has a heightened sense of drama that I really relate to for some reason. I really, you know, when you, when every four panels you got to have a cliffhanger. Obviously, it's it's not reality. This is a real heightened sense of drama that's going on there. But um, and and I really like you know I don't I, everything I, I I just love everything about the old adventure strips. I just think they're great. And so it was very easy for me to to do that with the, the Captain America strip. And I was just lucky enough that they were looking for Captain America product at the time. And I said to Brevoort, I said, you know, don't you think Captain America should have had an adventure strip back in the 40s? Superman had one. Batman had one. Wonder Woman had one. Why not Captain America? And and Tom said, go do it. <laughs> and I did it. <laughs> it's perfect. It really is. It was perfect for that. Yeah. No, I would, I, it, you know, unfortunately not many people or not enough people, I guess, thought that, Wendy, because I could have kept doing that forever. <laughs> so, but I'm glad Marvel let me do it, you know, for the equivalent of three months worth of the strip. So, uh, but I, uh, I would have had Namor come in next. Namor is my favorite asshole in comics. Yes. Yeah. I just picked up that new Defenders uh, series. Uh, the first issue that came out recently. And yeah, I just, I, I love Namor. Exactly. He's a, he's a dick. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the, the, the great thing about characters like that is they can move the plot forward so quickly because they're the sort of characters who can go, enough talking, let us go hit something. You know, you know. <laughs> I mean, really, I just love, you know, the flirtation of him and Sue Storm. I just see that they're my favorite. <laughs> Yeah, I have not seen that Defender, so I, I don't know if you're referring to something in that. But, um, like in the pack, but, you know. The, the sort of yeah, like but Namor. when Hickman when Hickman was doing Fantastic Four, and he had Namor in one. And, and uh, you know, there was one moment where he's interacting with Sue and he says something like, God, you're wonderful. <laughs> and it was just a perfect moment between Namor and Sue, you know. <laughs> you get the feeling Namor would have appreciated her more. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Reed appreciates it, but Namor, you know, the, the, the interaction between them is just delicious. It really is. But now you have a new book. Uh, you've revived. You've revived a, a book coming out through Image now. you got Section Zero. And yes, I do. Is, yes, and this is with Tom Grummet, who, of course, you've worked with many times before. And the two of you are the co-creators of con the modern Superboy. So you have such a wonderful history. Tell us a little bit about Section Zero. Well, um, Section Zero is... Uh, in very broad strokes, it is Jack Kirby does the X-Files. So you have all of the creepy monsters and a lot more hitting and explosions. And, um, you know, the details of Section Zero is that they are a uh, secret section of the United Nations Charter, which perpetually funds a team of experts and adventurers to investigate the strange and unknown. And uh, that's what they do. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I, I'm a huge fan of not only the, you know, Kirby comics and uh, Kniff, but I'm also a huge fan of Fortean Phenomena, Charles Fort, and uh, the writings of John Keel, who did the Mothman prophecies. And I've always been really fascinated with folklore and what, you know, people think they've seen and, you know, you know, uh, even, you know, going into fairies and, and uh, seeing angels and stuff. And I, and I really think there's, a real, you know, more and more it's being tapped in comics, but for many years it was not being tapped in comics. And I really, really, really wanted to do uh, a series of, you know, focusing on that sort of thing about people investigating the Loch Ness Monster and uh, changelings and, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, not so much ghosts necessarily. I really like the idea of, of creatures that have a physical form and, and are in, you know, take up physical space. But, um, but th- so that's what we're doing and uh, we're having a ball doing it. About the uh, the characters and sort of the team. Well, the team, like I said, is, since it was formed uh, as a part of the Charter of the United Nations, it's been around since uh, the late '40s uh, and, and '50s, and uh, so the team has changed uh, over time. But in our story, which you know, the first uh, three issues we published in 2000, so that's when the story is set. It, it focuses on a team which consists of um, a leader whose name is uh, Dr. Titania Challenger, Doc Challenger. And uh, she is, to my mind, a direct descendant of Professor Challenger from Arthur Conan Doyle's books. And, uh, you know, she's uh, she's a brilliant and beautiful scientist who can who really can do just about everything perfectly. She's she's a very Doc Savage sort of character. Um, and by her side is Sam Wildman, who... Uh, 
is a much more seat of your pants sort of character who makes it up as he goes along. I think of him as cut from the Indiana Jones mold. And uh, Doc and Tina, uh, uh, Tina and uh, Sam used to be married, but they're not anymore. And uh, that, you know, presents some interesting interaction between the two of them. Uh, also on the team is a classic gray air alien sort whose name is Tesla. And uh, he doesn't really know where he came from or what his backstory is. And little by little, uh, as, as we tell this story and as we tell other stories, we'll be piecing together his history. And uh, then joining them uh, in this, in the story is a young boy who unfortunately, unfortunately he's got a cursed tattoo. And when he scratches this tattoo, it transforms him into an insectoid creature for exactly one day. So he becomes a, he becomes a 24 hour bug. And, uh, he's, he's probably my favorite character, quite honestly. So, so that's kind of the core of the team. Oh yeah. We also have Sargasso who is a, a sea monster. He's, he's part, part, uh, as I say, he's part creature from the Black Lagoon and part thing from the Fantastic Four. So um, he's you know, kind of our hulky, broody monster character in the team. And uh, they have adventures. <laughs> <laughs> so is this sort of one of those things like Suicide Squad where the cast can like always evolve and always be, be changing? Oh, yeah. I mean, Suicide Squad or, you know, I mean, even Avengers might be a good example. I mean, there is an... an uh, it, you know, there has been other members in the past and there will be other members in the future. Um, you know, going back to the 19, you know, 40s and 50s when there was a very Challengers of the Unlight, Unknown uh, team of four characters, each from a different um, of the major countries that formed the, the United Nations. So we have United States, United Kingdom, France and Russia. Those four uh, uh, countries each supply one of the original members of Fantastic Four. So, yeah, so the team... Not Fantastic Four, I'm sorry, Section Zero. So the team changes over time and um, even changes during the course of this miniseries because since the book is anchored in real, in real historical events, uh, we decided from the beginning that the, er the characters had to age in real time. And so we published the first three issues in 2000, and then we didn't finish the story until 18 years later. And the characters all age 18 years. And uh, so that means some of the characters that were around in the first three issues are not around in the second three issues. And there's new characters that are in the second three issues. You originally published it through, uh, through Guerrilla Comics, and that was yeah. a subdivision of Image, right? What happened with right. that? Well, I mean, a lot of different things happened with that. I, um, you know, Guerrilla as, as a unit kind of fell apart because we thought we were getting certain financing that never came through. Um, personally, I, um, I went through some personal problems. I got divorced and that really meant I couldn't continue working on section, section zero at the time. So, um, so I had to step away from it so that I could work on things that paid my bills basically. And, um, but really from the time, really al almost from the day I told Tom Grumman, I couldn't work on it anymore. We tried to figure out how to bring it back. I mean, I, I was even talking to Jim Valentino days after telling him I could no longer work on it, going, is there, is there any way, any way we can make this work? And eventually, 18 years later, we did find a way to make it work. That's awesome. Had you and Tom, like, kept very close through, through the past 20 years? Or? Off and on. I mean, in the course of those 20 years, we uh, did a few fill-in issues of Fantastic Four together. Um, in 2012, we did try to revive Section Zero as a uh, webcomic. And so we produced 12 new pages of story at that point. But once again, it, it was not paying our bills. And we thought, oh, we can squeeze this in between our paying job. But you know what? No, you can't. We, we can't, at least. Because we, we devote too much time and give too much of our heart to Section Zero. Uh, and, and so we just don't it, – it's not something we can do on the side. We, we learned that the hard way. So what made now the perfect time? But, you know – it's always been the perfect time, Wendy. <laughs> Ever since 2000, we've thought every day since then was the perfect time to bring back Section Zero. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, really, it just comes down to the stars aligning. That's what Tom keeps saying is, you know, he said that over the years people would say, are you ever going to bring back Section Zero? And he goes, yeah, when the, when the stars aligned. And finally they did. And I mean, what probably, you know, without a doubt, the brightest star there was called Kickstarter because Kickstarter allowed us to get the money we needed so that we could 
pay our bills while finishing this story. And um, but the thing there is, of course, relatively speaking, very few people have, have read the book through kick, the Kickstarter volume. And so that's where Image comes in. And Image is, is taking that book, which are, uh, we just by our training, we broke it into what is the equivalent of six issues. And they're going to take the uh, the book we kickstarted, and they're going to publish it as a six issue miniseries. And so people who, you know, to this day, I get people who say, "Oh my God, I never knew you guys continued Section Zero. Well, hopefully, this is a way they can find out about it. These are the people, you know, this will get the book into comic shops. It'll get the book onto Comicology. It'll get the book into hands of people that would never have found out about it otherwise." Let's talk about some of the people you have doing covers for you. Like you've got Walt Simonson. Yeah, yeah, got Walt. I was very lucky. I got, we, you know, and he was just the first of many. You know, we have, you know, George Perez. We even have Adam Hughes who's supplying a cover. And I mean, granted, these people are, are people who did uh, prints and pinups for our hardcover book, for our, our kickstarted book, and uh, gave us permission to use those pinups as alternate covers. Um, I, I basically called in every favor I had in the industry to get, to get these pinups. And, um, because I wanted, you know, to to stack the deck as much in my favor as possible for that Kickstarter to be successful, and um, so yeah, I, I had I had some very wonderful people who uh, gave greatly of their time and talent, you know, like Adam and like Walt and like George and like Chris Somney and like Stuart Immerman and like Kelly Jones. Um, I I mean, you know, it was quite quite honestly very humbling uh, the response I got when I. Uh, reached out to people. Dave Gibbons. Dave Gibbons. Oh. I mean, I, it, like I said, very humbling that uh, I got the positive response that I did get. That is. That's thrilling. And I feel one of the best things about this book and something that's very, very much in, in everything you write is that you have such a, a sort of fun sense of adventure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't really explain that. I just know that um, I do my best work when I'm having fun doing it. And I think that colors the sort of stories I do. Um, there's many times I wish I was grim and gritty because that's what people like to read. That's what sells better. But uh, for better or worse, I produce fun comics. I produce comics that are really adventure comics. That's really is where my heart is. Yeah. Obviously one of the things you're best known for is, is your run on Superboy and, uh, I just wanted to talk about that. Like, what was what was very rewarding to you about writing Superboy and sort of helping create this new this new era of Superboy? Uh, well, I mean, you know, all credit all credit goes to you know Mike Carlin. I mean, that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't given me the call and asked me if I wanted to write Adventures of Superman. And uh, obviously, no one knew the death of Superman was going to be what it was at the time he offered me the job. Uh, I certainly didn't know it. I don't think Jerry Ordway knew it. I don't think Dan Jurgens knew it. I think we were all caught very much uh, off guard. But uh, but then man, I was kind of thrown into the deep end, and really, I think it comes down to stars aligning. You know, I mean, I can't say I've been wanting to do you know Superboy or that sort of character forever. But when we were trying to figure out how to bring that Superman, that character seemed to rise to the surface. Is all I can say. And, uh, you know, Tom drew him right away at that, at that Superman summit in a costume that basically, as far as I know, didn't change. Um, Tom originally gave him a, a, a more of a punk haircut, and Carlin said, give him the S-curl. <laughs> um, but that was like the only uh, editorial comment about Tom's design on Superboy. And uh, we, you know, for some reason, we just seemed to hit a nerve. And, uh, and that's, very, that's always very gratifying, you know, because... I do like comics that have humor in them. I do like, uh, you know, I, I, and, and like I said, you know, Namor's a great asshole, and on some level, so is Superboy. I mean, Superboy is, <laughs> you know, that, that sort of character is fun to write. You know, the character that screws up, the character that isn't always right, um, whether they admit it or not, uh, and, uh, you know, who sometimes is their own worst enemy, sometimes puts their foot in their mouth. Um, as I said, Superboy had the arrogance of youth, and uh, there's a lot to mine in that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like now it's Damian Wayne. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's definitely that that 
brash young asshole kind of kid, you know. But yeah, and, and he was probably a little he's probably a little more of an asshole than Superboy ever yes. was. Yeah. <laughs> so your Superboy is just kind of emo, you know. <laughs> yeah. So um but but I mean, you know, he was the sort of character we were having great fun with and it was great, you know, very gratifying that the fans responded the way they did and gave us the chance to uh you know, do two great runs on Superboy. Um, you know, I think we wrote right, wrote and do about what two thirds of that hundred issues. So we're very, I'm very proud of those runs. Yeah, yeah, that was it was a long time. It definitely, re, you know, you redefined the character. It's it's uh, even even now when I read things like Super Sons, you know, even even that Superboy is still I feel reflective of of your work. Interesting. I yeah, I have to say, uh, you know, nothing against the Super Sons, but I have not read that, so I don't know. Um, you know, I know when when that was happening, I had people say, "Oh, are you really upset that your Superboy has kind of been, you know, forgotten?" And I said, "You know, the idea that Superboy is the son of Superman, I, I can't argue with that. That's not a bad idea, you know." So how can I get upset? You know what I mean? Right. No, no. Superboy just has heart. That's that's the whole core of his his being. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I, and I have to say, I think, uh, you know, it's, it is very uh, hum humbling and gratifying when you see other people take, you know, some, the, the groundwork you put down and, and expand on it. And, uh, you know, like, once again, Jeff Johns, you know, people were saying to me, oh, what did you think about what Jeff Johns did with Superboy? And I said, I thought he did great stuff with Superboy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, I love the idea that he, he made him a clone, you know, uh, of Lex Luthor. I mean, that was something for, edi for editorially, for editorial reasons was uh, off limits to us at the time. But, you know, times change, things, you know, outlooks change. And, you know, Jeff was uh, smart enough to, to see an opportunity and take it. And now I'm very interested to see what Bendis is going to do with Superboy. I'm sure it's going to be really, really great. But once again, you can't feel that you own these characters you know like there's only so much so much ownership that that you can take over a, a you know long-running idea oh yeah exactly and uh you know i mean uh may, maybe i wouldn't have made this analogy uh before i had kids but it is, seems to be a lot like having kids at some point you gotta let them go you know what i mean mm -hmm. and uh hopefully you've laid you know you've laid the, the the foundation uh well enough that uh they'll, I don't know, stay true to your vision or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, I mean, I'm also very gratified with the use that uh, Dove is getting in, in the media and comics nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I haven't changed the industry, but there's, there's a few little pebbles I've thrown in there that, that I'm very, uh, you know, thankful and uh, grateful that I was part of. Well, I mean, that's the greatest honor. That's the greatest legacy. I, I haven't watched. Is Hawk and Dove there on uh, Titans or? Yeah, they're in the the you know the Hawk and the female Dove. Hawk and the female Dove are on the Teen Titans TV show, mm -hmm. which I haven't seen because I don't get the streaming service. But um, right. I've heard very good things about their appearance. Yeah, people are people are very torn about. It. I watched the episode of Doom Patrol, and I thought you know I thought they were very cool. I thought they handled Doom Patrol well. I heard that too. Yeah. Yeah, but people are you know people are torn. Some people really really don't like hearing you know hearing Robin say fuck. <laughs> well, you know, like I said, I haven't seen the show, so I was surprised to hear that the, there was that level of language. Yeah. Um, I, and, you know, I mean, quite honestly, you know, that touches on my whole uh, disagreement with DC's whole direction for the last 15 years or so, that they, they seem to think they need to take the darker road. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you saw that in their movies. And uh, on the other hand, look at what happened with Marvel. I mean, Marvel, I think, took the lighter road, and I think clearly their movies. I, I think you can not. You, there's no argument that their movies have a broader appeal than the DC movies. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm confused about why DC continues to follow that that uh that um direction, which to me seems to be such a dead end and so exclusive instead of inclusive. Yeah. I have to agree. <laughs> Anyways, my, my two cents, my two cents. <laughs> Speaking of light and goofy, you worked on Marvel Apes. Let's remind people of that moment in, in history. We really have to? Do we really have to? No, I mean, I have to admit, yeah, it is a goofy moment in my career, let me tell you. you know, um, when, Matt, when, uh, um, 
when I got the call from Marvel and they said, how would you like to write Marvel Apes? And I said, really? Are you serious? Um, and then I had to sit down and figure if I really could write that, could I really make it work? And, um, and I, obviously I, I found a way. So, but, um, yeah, that was, that was a very strange call and that was a very strange assignment. Um, and it has high points and it has low points. So, <laughs> Marvel Zombies was such a, like, it was so weird. I remember, like, it was such a big hit, but probably a lot of people don't think about it now, you know? But but at the time, that was that was the, the thing. Oh, Marvel Zombies, yeah, that was, you know? <laughs> and, and believe me, I'm a huge fan of zombies, so I was very aware of those books, yeah. <laughs> but it felt like Marvel Apes was like a dare or something. It wasn't something somebody shouted out at a panel somewhere. I, I, you know, I don't know the whole history, but yeah, someone gave the idea to Casada and he... He, he thought that there was potential in it. Um, and, and, I, and I would say, you know, I mean, obviously Joe's got a good track record, but not everyone always hits a home run. It, but, uh, but, uh, but when they offered me the job, I was like sitting there going, well, how, how can I do this? How can I do this? And, and I came up with, you know, a basic story. And when I, when I uh, talked to the editor about it, he goes, he goes, oh, I didn't know you were going to work out a whole story. Otherwise, I'd have told you that Joe – Joe wants the, the 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 apes to be vampires too, and I said, "What?" <laughs> what? <laughs> but but I think Joe, you know, and I've never talked to Joe about this, but my feeling is Joe wanted that so that the apes had it weren't just goofy; that there was a level of danger to them. And and actually, my the story I was coming up with. That was my concern, too. My concern was, we don't want this to just be goofy. We want there to be a real level of threat. And my, my, my answer to that was just to stress the animalistic nature of these, these creatures, yes. that, that it wasn't very far below the surface. And in some of the characters, it was on the surface. But So I think we, we had different solutions to the same problem, is, is my way of reading that. I can't believe they're like, well, we, we didn't think you'd actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, they, yeah, they thought I would just say, yes, I want to write it or no, I don't want to write it. But, but I actually had to figure out a story because if I didn't have a story, I, I, I'm just not the sort who can say, yeah, I'll figure that out. I, I've got to know that I can figure it out before I say yes. But DC has very capable, threatening ape characters, you know, like Gorilla Grodd and, you know, and they, they, they get it done. <laughs> yeah, but there's something in Marvel Apes, and if you're talking about a world, you know, where you've got Spider Monkey and stuff, there, there's an inherent um, goofiness, like you said, in it, um, and and so there had to be something to offset that to uh, to make it not just you know a parody, not just a parody. And for some reason, believe it or not, I've always liked the Gibbon. I don't, I can't even tell you why, but even before I broke into the business, I had this idea for a Gibbon story, and. So I actually folded that into Marvel Apes. You know, you never know when ideas can be used. You never know. <laughs> you got to hang on to this stuff. Yeah. Also, Marvel, you had done a run on Daredevil. And, uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, do you feel like like years later, uh, people always refer to it as very underappreciated. Do you feel like you're finally getting uh, the, the attention, the love that you deserve for that run? Um, I, I don't necessarily feel I've been missing out on any attention or love for that work. Um, I still get people who say to this day that they really love that run on Daredevil. And, um, you know, I, I think we had some high points and I think we had some low points. And um, I think Mark Wade did the Daredevil I was trying to do. Uh, and, you know, Mark's a good friend and he's a great writer. But, I mean, every time I read his Daredevil, I said, that's, that's what I was going for and that's what I didn't quite reach. Well, it's it's excellent. I mean, you know, th those are some high high standards of daredeviling. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyway, so but uh, but yeah, I mean, I enjoyed working on Daredevil. I was thrilled to get the offer, and um, I mean, uh, you know, unfortunately, once again, it comes down to uh, some editorial decisions. I, there were certain things I wanted to do with the book that Marvel wasn't interested in, and, and at the end, I I felt that uh, where I wanted to go was not where Marvel wanted to go, but Years later, you know, I, you know, you know. For instance, and, and I think people, mo mo most people know this. I really wanted to have Matt run for mayor of New York City, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe even become mayor. I thought that that would be a really interesting storyline. And at the time, they were just going, 
well, everyone knows that the mayor of New York City isn't Matt Murdock. And that was a line they didn't want to cross. Now, since then, of course, you know, Lex Luthor has become president of the United States. You know, this is this sort of, you know, merging reality and, and fantasy to that level was not heard of at the time and was very resisted at the time. And now it isn't. Um, and in fact, you know, when Mark was on Daredevil and he wrote that uh, 50th anniversary um anniversary special about Daredevil. He even said that Daredevil had been, Matt had been mayor of San Francisco. And Mark told me, he goes, you know, that's my way of getting your idea in the book, Carl. Aww. So anyways, so, you know, times change. That's what, and, and, you know, you have to be in the right place at the right time. And not everyone always is, you know, that certainly has been my experience. Well, I mean, it, it just seems so ridiculous that there was a time where people couldn't accept the idea of, like, like, well, we already know there's a real mayor in New York. You know? Yeah. Well, that was, you know, and, you know, yeah, that was, that was my reaction. That was, that was the reaction I got. I mean, the so. whole book Ex Machina, you know, the, the Tony Harris book about, about a mayor with superpowers. It, it, right. Like, yeah. I mean, that's, it, it, it's more, the, the most unbelievable thing about that book is that he's more libertarian, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, between, uh, you know, Section Zero working in there, you've also done X-Files stories. Yeah, I did, and I got that job because I had done Section Zero. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think it was Chris Ryle, who was at, at IDW at the time, said, when they were looking for writers, they said, hey, Carl did, like, an X-Files-like book. Maybe he'd like to. And, and yes, yes, Chris, yes, I would like to. So, so that was fun. I mean, uh, I, you know, I haven't written a lot of, uh, licensed properties. I did X-Files and then I did for, uh, for Dynamite, I did a Battlestar Galactica. And in both cases I found, um, those are, you know, I, 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 I'm not trying to pat myself on the back here, but those are very easy to write because the voices of the characters are so distinct in your head because you've heard them for years on the TV. Mm -hmm. So you know how Scully speaks, you know how Mulder speaks, you know how Starbucks speaks, you know how Gaius Baltar speaks. Um, and it makes writing those characters a lot easier. Were you doing the, uh, the 70s BSG or the, the modern BSG? Oh, the modern, modern. I, I, I don't think I've ever watched the... Uh, the original. I mean, I think as a kid, I saw that it was on and watched a little bit, and I said, "Boy, is this boring." <laughs> See, I love that. I, that and Buck Rogers, like those were on all the time when I was little. I love those shows. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I have no affinity for the uh, the classic, the original Buck uh, Battlestar Galactica, but I love the reimagined one. I thought that that was that was a brilliant piece of TV, and. There, there were so many times they could have jumped the shark, and they came close a few times, but the, those guys had real talent and real ability and real vision, and they, they pulled it all together, and it's still one of my very favorite shows. Right. Well, I mean, just the whole concept of it at first, you're, you're so resistant to watch it. It's like, oh, the Cylons are sexy women now, you know, like it, it was so. Like, you, you might have been resistant to that idea. I was not. I was not <laughs> resistant to that idea. <laughs> I was highly resistant to that idea, but it was awesome. It was fantastic. Yeah, and, and especially like uh, with uh, uh, Mary, what's her name, Roslyn, President Roslyn. Like, right. it's, it's so tricky to have anything involving a character with cancer, you know, yeah. because you feel like if you bring them back that somehow it kind of cheapens mm -hmm. the, the real life nature of cancer. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. And like I said, they, they came close to jumping the shark a few times, but they, they walked the line and, and they walked it back a few times. And I think the cancer storyline was one of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was, that was very close. And of course, everything I did with Baltar was so was so uh, fantastic. You know, like he ran the gamut of every type of, of emotion throughout the Yeah, you know, Baltar is, you know, one of the great characters in the history of TV. You know, yeah. he's just so great. Making him like a messiah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and that's the other thing you have to admire about that show is they kind of know they had a feel for when an idea had run its course, and then they would just go in a different direction, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, that in, in some ways that's why uh, I I really like the Good Place. The Good Place is once you think you know what the show is about, they go in a completely different direction. Right, right, and it's the fact that like it, it's been like three seasons now, and the fact that it takes such a different direction for each season. It's, I know. For a comedy, especially, is is amazing. 
Yeah, yeah. And I've only seen the first two seasons because uh, I haven't watched it on whatever it is, CBS. I've only watched it on Netflix, and they only have the first two seasons. But but I've heard about the third season, and I assume at some point I'll see it. Yeah, yeah. So. It's on NBC. Yeah, NBC. Sorry, sorry I said CBS. I just knew it was one of the major three. <laughs> yeah, I had to correct. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I watch it on Hulu, you know? I feel like nobody watches anything on the actual networks anymore. Who does? I don't, you know, yeah, when was the last time when was the last time you said, Oh my god, it's Friday nine o'clock, I gotta be home to watch? No one says that anymore, you yeah, know? I guess maybe for sporting like live sports or something, but I don't think Oh, see, that's a good point. And you know what? I don't watch sports. I'm not a sports guy, so right. I, that isn't on my radar. Yeah, but I mean I think like that's the only thing where it's like real in time spoilers really affect everybody. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Think about but, the, the Super Bowlings or you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very good point. That probably still is, you know, destination TV or whatever they call it. But uh, but otherwise, you know, with TiVo and with streaming, you can watch it when you want to watch it, and that's what I do. That's what we do and have for years, obviously. So I want to talk a little bit about your family, if I may. Okay. There was uh, the. Tremendous, tremendous, heartwarming story of of uh, you adopting your 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 child, you know, and uh, who had a heroin exposure, mm -hmm. and and the, and how you sold your comic collection. We had, had decided that we, uh, you know, my my wife and I were hoping to have a family, and it didn't happen, and so uh, we decided um, to adopt. And quite late in life, actually, you know, I I actually just turned sixty, believe it or not, oh. but um. But anyways, uh, so, you know, this was, I was, you know, like 52 when we decided to do this. But, uh, you know, I am not a rich man and, you know, uh, adoption is expensive. And so what we decided was that uh, to pay for the adoption, uh, cost of the adoption, when it came through, when it happened, if it happened, we would sell my comic collection. And that is what we did. I, you know, I think it was, uh, uh, I think I made out quite well on the deal, quite honestly. And, um, you know, it, it, you know, I, you know, I got real good response. We sold enough comics to cover our cost for uh, the adoption. Um, now, how so old was yeah. your collection? Like, 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 what are we talking? What big issues are you getting rid of here? Oh, Avengers number one, Spider-Man number one. I, I, you know, ba basically I had all of the Marvel comics, uh, all of, you know, all of the main comics except Fantastic Four all the way back to number one. I had Fantastic Four back to number eight. And I did keep my Fantastic Fours because I love that title so much. And I also had a complete run of Tales to Astonish all the way back to she one. And I love those old monster comics a lot. And I like Ant-Man and Giant Man. So I kept actually Tales to Astonish. Those are the only two runs I kept. But I had X-Men back to one. I had Daredevil back to one. I had Iron, you know, I had Iron Man back to Tales of Suspense 39. I had, I had all of them, uh, and uh, I got rid of all of them. And some people were very nice. They actually bought the comics and gave them back to me. Aww. No, there was, there was a lot of generosity out there. There was a lot of generosity out there. So, um, so anyways, yeah, so, but, you know, and like I said, I, uh, I think I made out, a, uh, I got, I, I came out ahead in the deal because Isaac is a great kid. And he's now he he will turn seven in in the spring, and uh, he's you know he's you know I I have no regrets about any of that. That's wonderful. That's so. Oh, did you did you go on and how big is your family now? Well, we we did adopt a second uh, child, uh, Eliza, who now is um well in December she turned five. Oh. So we have a five year old and a, and a, and an almost seven year old at home right now. They're, uh, and they're, they're both great kids. They're both great kids. And, um, and the only thing is, is, you know, I'm going to be in my seventies when they graduate high school. <laughs> so, <laughs> 70 is the new 40. That's what I have here. Yes. <laughs> well, you've got a great life. So. Oh no. Myrna is a wonderful, wonderful gal. I love her so much. And I'm really, I'm very lucky to have found her. Very lucky. So let's go back. So we can, when can we find section zero? That's coming out. From Image, it's going to come up from Image. The miniseries will come up from Image in April, I believe. If all goes according to plan, the on sale date for issue number one will be April third. So, friends, and, get in there, get into your comic shops, and request that. Make those. Yeah, ask, make ask them to order section zero. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I have to say, uh, 
We are about to launch the next Section Zero Kickstarter. Sometime in February, we will be launching a Kickstarter for Section Zero 1959, which uh, will focus on the original team. And uh, 59 is the year I was born. It was the year Tom Grummet was born, so that is not an accident. But it's also the year, you know, when, you know, Kirby was doing Challengers of the Unknown and doing, you know, some of those great Marvel monster stories like Tim Boo Ba and Fin Fang Foom and Goom, Son, Son of Goo Gam and all of that. All of this stuff I have a deep love for. And so this is our love letter to those stories and kind of a birthday gift to ourselves. And I think uh, it'll be something special for the readers, too. But anyways... That's a Kickstarter we're going to be launching very soon, and uh, people might want to check that out. If the image series sells well enough, then the uh, Kickstarter, that will be our business model going forward. We will do a Kickstarter to pay our bills so we can afford to do the Section Zero stories, and then we can hand the book off basically free of charge to Image, and then they can get it into comic shops and stuff like that. But um, that's only if the image miniseries sells well enough for them to keep asking us back. So, um, we're, you know, I'm hoping it will. I'm hoping it will. Yeah. Friends get out there. Go and go and pre-order that now. Go get your little previews out. And right. That. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that's, that's keeping me busy. Section zero is pretty much my life right now. And, and I could not be happier, quite honestly. Well, so thank you so much for talking to me. Is there anything else anything else you want to add? Any words of wisdom? No, if if anyone wants to check out the Section Zero Kickstarter, I'm not trying to steer them away from Image. This is if you want to support Image, that's great. If you want to support the Kickstarter, that's great. If you want to support both, I'm not gonna stop you. But uh, to find out more, they should go to sectionzerocomic.com. Um, where they can actually still order the original graphic novel that we offered through Kickstarter. Or they can wait and pay a little less and get the comics from Image. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Wendy. It's been great to talk to you.